from the station working for you. This is WRTV News at 6, streaming now. Good evening. We will begin with continuing fallout from Wednesday's attack on the U.S. Capitol. I'm Rafael Sanchez in for Nicole Griffin. There have been some calls for President Trump to resign. And Democrats have begun laying the groundwork for impeachment. ABC's Faith Abube reports on what's being done and crafted in Congress. President Trump facing growing outrage following Wednesday's attack on the U.S. Capitol building. Twitter cutting off the president's account, quote, due to the risk of further incitement of violence. Democrats threatening to impeach the president for a second time, accusing him of, quote, willfully inciting violence against the government. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi speaking out in an interview with CBS's 60 Minutes. Sadly, the person who's running the executive branch is a deranged, unhinged, dangerous president of the United States, uh, but he has done something so serious uh, that there should be prosecution against him. President-elect Joe Biden leaving the decision up to Congress. The quickest way that that will happen is us being sworn in on the 20th. Even some in the president's own party calling for his resignation. Republican Senator Lisa Mikowski in an interview saying, quote, I want him out. He has caused enough damage. Others calling for the 25th Amendment to be invoked. All indications are that the president has become unmoored, not just from his duty, nor even his of, but from reality. It's Meanwhile, law enforcement combing through all social media posts, surveillance video and cell phone data, and receiving thousands of tips after releasing Bolo posters. Uh, there are a myriad of, of laws that can be, federal laws that can be utilized in, in cases like this. Firearms offenses crossing state lines, explosives, of course, crossing state lines. So far, 13 people have been charged in federal court. Richard Barnett photographed with his feet on Speaker Pelosi's desk, facing federal charges, including unlawful entry and theft of public property. He's now turned himself in to authorities in Arkansas. Authorities are also looking for this man, accused of planting pipe bombs near the RNC and DNC headquarters. Faith Abube, ABC News, Washington. Uh, tonight, Hoosiers are across Across the board have many opinions on what should happen next in this situation. WRTV spoke to a professor at IU Bloomington who's an expert on voting behavior. He says impeachment is unlikely with 11 days in President Trump's presidency just to go. So whether we're talking about the 25th Amendment or an impeachment, it's unlikely that the president will be removed. I think Democrats are, are concerned about sending a message to future presidents that you know, the, the actions that we've seen are, are unacceptable. Um, and I, I think that's more their concern than, than actually thinking they have a chance of, of getting him out of the White House before his term ends. There are reports that Vice President Mike Pence, Indiana's former governor, has indicated no interest in invoking the 25th Amendment to remove the president from office. The state's attorney general-elect is pushing back on criticism following a tweet he sent supporting the president. Todd Rokita tweeted that he will always be with the president. He says he sent out that tweet of support to express his support for the president and to see if the big tech companies would also shut down his Twitter account like they did with the president's. That has not happened to Mr. Rokita. The attorney general-elect is raising concerns about Twitter's ability to control certain free speech. Rokita says he condemns the violence at the Capitol and the violence from last summer's demonstrations. Now, despite that, the state's Democratic Party issued this statement saying, in part, it's your job to pledge allegiance to the United States not a politician with dangerous un-American ideology. On Monday, Mr. Okita, the governor and lieutenant governor, will be sworn in at the Indiana State Museum. Now, due to COVID-19, that ceremony is closed to the public. State Supreme Court Justice Loretta Rush will administer the oath of office at 11 a.m during a private ceremony. On this Saturday, many of us oh, were a little blue as the Colts fell short during their playoff game in Buffalo. Sports anchor Brad Brown joins us right now with your highlights and Brad, we are a little disappointed. Raphael, if you were cheering for the Colts, yes, indeed. They needed a little help just to get into the postseason. That happened last weekend when Buffalo defeated Miami. So the Colts' first playoff test, well, of course, it would just happen to be the Bills. Buffalo had waited 25 years for a playoff win. The Colts would be on the losing side of today's result. Missed opportunities were the theme of the day. The Colts really controlled the ball well in the first half. Going forward on fourth and goal. Final two minutes of the second quarter. Phillip Rivers' pass, though, was too long for Michael Pittman, so no points on that drive. And on the opening drive of the second half, the Colts had a 14-play drive, went more than seven minutes. Rodrigo Blankenship's field goal, though, 
bonked off the upright. So another chance at three points comes up empty. Fourth quarter, another. Colts go for a two-point conversion after a penalty on their PAT kick. But Jonathan Taylor gets stuffed in the middle of the pile. So just right there, we've shown potentially 12 points left on the table. It was, as you know, only a three-point margin at the end. 27-24, the Colts' Hail Mary on the final play falls short. So it's one and done in the playoffs again. A tough loss was not was not anticipating this uh, the end of the year winding up today. Uh, really felt confident coming into this week. Felt like our guys were ready to play. And, uh, and I think that showed. I, I think we played a good game. I think we played a good football team. So hats off to the Buffalo Bills. It's playoff football. I mean, it's playoff football. That's what we talked about at halftime, this, how much fun this was. Fun in a relative sense, I suppose, at this point. Coming up later, we'll have more highlights from the game. We'll have reaction from Philip Rivers, Darius Leonard, and other Colts players. Don't forget, we'll have the Rayton Ravens Titans wildcard game tomorrow at 1 right here on WRTV. Raphael. Right, we'll see you tonight, and we'll, we'll see you a little bit later here on the News at 6, and of course tonight at 11. Disappointing loss, but of course, we had a lot of sunshine in central Indiana, which made up for the loss. Meteorologist uh, Kyle Mountain standing by with your Saturday forecast. Hey, Kyle. Yeah, a little brighter finish to the day for us here, Raphael, but temperatures moved very little throughout our Saturday. Number right at 30 for the high in Indianapolis, as well as the Columbus area. A little warmer for you today in Muncie at 35, but check out beautiful sunset there across the the Circle City as we did see some breaks in that cloud cover. Your skies have gone mostly clear right now in Lafayette and Bloomington with temperatures in the middle to upper 20s. A light north wind enough that it's giving us a wind chill feels like 18 downtown feels like 22 for you in the Bloomington area and it feels like 27 in Tipton. There's a look at those clouds eroding away, but it might be temporary. We'll see a few more clouds as we go through tonight. Temperatures though still in the middle 20s right on through 10 o'clock. We've got a warm up that's in your seven day forecast in just few minutes. Uh, Kyle, we'll see you in a few moments. Metro Police investigating after three people shot in two separate incidents early this morning. Detectives believe one person was shot around 530 this morning at North College Avenue and 34th Street. And that person later walked into Eskenazi Hospital to get medical help. Then a few hours later, uh, around 2.30 this morning, two people suffering from gunshot wounds showed up at Community East Hospital. Police are asking for your help tonight if you have any information on either of these cases. Now to our continuing coverage on COVID-19's impact on Indiana. The State Department of Health reports another 6,045 people have been diagnosed with the virus. 75 more deaths were reported. The total number of deaths now stands at 8,595. Since March, more than 558,000 Hoosiers have tested positive for COVID-19, and more than 6 million tests have been administered right here in our state. Those age 80 and older are showing a high interest in getting that vaccine, either the Pfizer one or the one from Moderna. As of today, 75,000 Hoosiers scheduled an appointment to get the first of two doses. Now to register an individual, a caregiver or a loved one, all they have to do is call 211. Consider this, people age 80 and older make up less than 4% of the state's population, but represent more than 19% of people being treated for COVID-19 in hospitals statewide and represent more than half of the COVID-related deaths in Indiana. In some parts of the country, the biggest challenge surrounding the COVID-19 vaccine is not distribution, but misinformation circulating online. Dan Grossman spoke with health leaders pushing back on the misleading information. Walk into Dr. Luke McWhorter's office and you'll see it. It gets frustrating sometimes. Pokes and jokes at something far more serious than the caricatures on his wall might suggest. My job is to try to educate people um, with the knowledge that I have um, and try to reassure people that um, that what they're doing is safe for them and for, you know, for their loved ones. Ever since the development of a vaccine, Dr. McCorder has been getting questions and lots of them. The biggest concern has probably been new technology. Many are legit, but others are based on claims, conspiracies even, making the rounds on social media. mRNA vaccines will change your DNA. Um, that is not possible for it to do that. You know, definitely some of the, the 5G and the microchip uh, 
misinformation. Heidi Parker gets them too. She works for a nonprofit focused on combating misinformation in Nevada, one of the states with the lowest immunization rates among adults in the country. We know that this vaccine is the tool that we need, you know, to restore our communities and, and get past this pandemic. It might sound obvious, but she says pushing out accurate information through credible sources like doctors and physicians is the best way forward. She acknowledges the small sector of our country that simply won't vaccinate themselves or their children but says that cohort of people is small enough that it shouldn't impact the fact-driven base looking for accurate information to guide their decision. Seeing their peers get vaccinated and hearing from their peers um, why you know they made the decision to get vaccinated, um, I think is really key. I had a sore arm for a few days and that's been it. Dr. McWhorter is a testament to that. Most of his staff has been vaccinated and they can use their experiences to reassure those with questions that what they are doing is safe, helpful, and even altruistic. For the greater good of the population, we need to get um, the vast majority of people vaccinated so that this pandemic will eventually end. I'm Dan Grossman reporting. Granting hope. Next, the money that will help those in need with a big plan. We'll visit the place with those plans. You're watching WRTV on this Saturday. Welcome to Delicious. Working together, a local church is planning to make a major investment in its neighborhood. New Direction Church in Indianapolis was awarded a $75,000 grant from the Eli Lilly Endowment. The money will be used to help with rent assistance, groceries for families, scholarships, and to help with housing. Now, New Direction is putting up $25,000 of its own money to support those necessary programs. This was something, we were blindsided by the blessing. Um, I got a phone call from Lilly's Endowment and they said that they wanted to speak to us. It was at the end of 2020. And so I was on the phone conference uh, with them and they shared with us their desire to help us make a difference. They highlighted us and they thanked us for the work that we've done in our community. And they said, we wanna be a blessing to you all so that you can continue the efforts. New Direction, you deserve that blessing. And tonight at 11 right here on WRTV, we'll take a closer look at their efforts and their impact, especially during the pandemic. Now time to check your forecast. And it was a great to see all that sunshine today, Kyle. Yeah, nice to break those clouds apart, get a little bit of brighter sky in here just before that sunset. Now, snow lovers, you've been left disappointed so far this season. We've picked up less than three inches of snow in Indianapolis. Now, some areas have had a little more than that, but there's where we should be on average. Average, a little over 10 inches of snow. I don't see that changing anytime soon for us as we look at the really big picture here on the satellite and radar. You can see there are the clouds, but not really looking at any precipitation. We go back toward Denver and you can see in eastern Colorado, that's where they're dealing with some snow tonight, and that's not really going to be moving our way. Temperatures out there, 25 in Indianapolis, so we've seen a quick drop in the number with those clouds kind of clearing out. It's 27 for you in Bloomington and 32 in the Muncie area, so temperatures this evening will be dropping through the middle 20s here. I do think we'll see a few more of those clouds building back in, and especially as we get into our Sunday morning, we'll see those clouds and mostly cloudy skies here for the second half of the weekend. So this time of year, it is difficult to really clear out those clouds for very long. And we'll have mostly cloudy conditions, but I do think we will stay on the dry side here for Sunday. Again, we're not seeing any weather systems really rolling through here, and that's what's keeping us kind of in this stagnant, cloudy, and chilly weather pattern. So our temperatures on Sunday, Middle 20s for you here as we get to 9 a.m. We'll get around 31 at noon. May see some breaks of sunshine out there, but mostly cloudy through the afternoon. And that will send our high, once again, seasonable levels here for early January. About 34 in Indy, 35 in the Bloomington area. A little closer to the 40 degree mark in Columbus. And the wind should be fairly light, so not really going to add too much of an extra chill to the air. But this chilly air is going to start to move out. Our temperatures moderating a little bit as we get into the upcoming work and school week. Temperatures making their way into the lower and even maybe some middle 40s here by the middle part of the week. Let's put it all together in that extended forecast now. And you've got temperatures in the 30s next couple of days. 41 with some sunshine on Tuesday. Should be a little brighter start to the week. 
Those clouds come back, though, with highs in the mid 40s on Thursday. A few flurries and colder to end the week. Uh, Kyle, thank you so much. Three points short. The Colts playoff run ends in Buffalo this afternoon. Brad's back with a full recap of the wild card Saturday game right here on the News at 6. And buys Indy.com. to you once again. Thanks for spending part of your Saturday with us. The Colts managed an 11 and 5 record in the regular season. Just two teams in league history ever missed the postseason with that win total. The fact is this though, the Colts only got the wild card because the NFL expanded to a seventh playoff team in each conference this season. The Colts response, well, we'll just be the first seventh seed to win the whole thing. Playing in Buffalo today, the first time this season they had fans up there, just a little under 7,000. They got rowdy by the end of the day. Colts managed just a field goal in the first quarter in the second. A long drive ends in a short score. Jonathan Taylor's one-yard touchdown run gave the Colts a 10-7 lead midway through the second. Later in the first half, on a fourth and goal, Frank Reich decides to go for it. The pass to Michael Pittman was incomplete. Colts called a good play on that one, but they left a minute 46 for Josh Allen to bring it back the other way, and the Buffalo quarterback was great all day. A 10-play, 96-yard drive to wind down the first half. Finishes it up by calling his own number, and the touchdown run gave Buffalo a 14-10 lead at halftime. The real excitement in this one came when they got to the fourth quarter as Buffalo continued to extend its lead. Allen scrambling, moving, would find Stephon Diggs on a 35-yard touchdown over the top. 24-10. Was it over at that point? Not quite. If you're the Colts, they would finally get the offense dialed in. Rivers to Zach Paschal. He would find the end zone for the TD. Colts went for two, though, and missed it. So they're down eight, chasing some points as the day went on. After a Bills field goal, it's Rivers to Jack Doyle for the touchdown. They would then connect on a two-point conversion. So it was a three-point game down the stretch. Final minutes then. There's the two. Colts on the move with a minute to go. This play is going to be talked about for a long time afterwards. Zach Paschal had the catch. Did he get back up and go? Eventually the ball comes loose. If you're on Buffalo's side, you think that's a fumble. Game over. Colts got to keep it, though. Kept that drive alive. Couldn't move the ball any further, though, and it came down to a Hail Mary in the final seconds, and that one would fall short. It was just not meant to be this afternoon as the Colts come up three points short when it was all done. 27-24 the final score. Both quarterbacks really good today. 309 yards for Rivers, 324 for Allen. Each threw two touchdowns. Allen, we showed you the one he ran in. Jack Doyle had a big day. Michael Pittman also had several big catches for the Colts. 472 total yards of offense, just not enough on this Saturday. A range of emotions afterwards, disappointment chief among them. We love to win them all. I mean, that's, 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 that's competition. That's sports. But today we did. Today we just missed. You know, we just missed. We played, we played well enough to win in so many, in so many ways. But, but, you know, like my dad always says, y'all heard the phrase almost, almost doesn't count horseshoes, hanger nades, whatever, wherever the phrase is. Um, that's kind of what it was today. It didn't feel any different. It still sucks um, when, when you don't finish out how you want to finish out. Um, but, uh, this is just something you, I mean, we're going to have to learn from it. I mean, this is just the kind of film you don't want to watch, um, but you're going to have to um, in order to, to prepare for next season. It's not really a success unless you win it all, and only one team does that. Um, do we do some good things? Yeah, for sure. We, you know, won 11 games. Um, you know, you, you want to win your division, so, you know, didn't accomplish that goal. Um, but, yeah, I think, like, I, I would say I think we did some good things. I mean, it hurts. I mean, it's what you, you work for your whole life. You know, you grind day in and day out, you know, to make it to the playoffs. And we, it just just hurt, man. It just it sucks. It sucks. It was, it was a, heck of a heck of a team to be a part of. So, um, certainly disappointing finish like this when you you just believe it's the year, you know. And I think that's that's a competitor in me. I've never not believed it was the year. But uh, it was a it was a special a special team to be a part of. You see Rivers emotional after the game. We don't know if this will be the last time he suits up for the Colts. What does the quarterback think about coming back next season? I'll have that from Rivers coming up tonight on the News at 11. We'll see you then. Raphael and Kyle will be back to wrap up tonight's News at 6 after one more break. Tina Mudd. 
Look at the billboards. You still have a chance to be a multi-millionaire. The Mega Millions jackpot has reached $600 million for just the fourth time in history. The jackpot increased after no ticket matched all six numbers drawn on Friday. While there was no one got the jackpot, there were 2.5 million winners, including five tickets with the game's second prize. Of course, those sold in California, Georgia, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New York. The jackpot was last won on September the 15th. The next drawing is next Tuesday. So good luck to you. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum is once again welcoming guests. It reopened Friday at 25% capacity. The museum closed in November due, to, of course, to COVID-19 cases in the county. Now the plan is to open from 10 to 4 daily until March the 1st. Then hours will expand to 9 to 5. The Kiss the Bricks track tours also resumed on Friday. When that track, I think of May weather. Yeah, we got about 140 <laughs> days to race day there, Raphael. A little cold yeah. between now and then. Good night. We'll see you tonight at 11.